it's interesting. And as you're uh, talking about the the painting um, and this whole no paradox that uh, you know, the more we mix things up and we um, basically enter into the shadow and we we go through the shadow that um that we're getting close to the truth because it's getting beneath the veneer of the word the logon or whatever which is mm -hmm. not the form itself it's uh i think um plato's term uh, that you reference is it's a form of mimesis yes right so it's it's a cheap imitation right um and it reminds me <clears throat> there's another i i hope uh, we get a chance to discuss it there's another uh there's a philosopher named wolfgang gigrich has an interesting take on on the cave um and he's hegelian so he's all about uh the truth is logically negative mm. right so that so that if you the moment you you capture something in a time and name it it's already moved on exactly. right the truth the soul the, of the thing consciousness in, in a very abstract sense has, has moved on to something else you, you just can't you, you can sort of catch the ether of it yeah, yeah. Uh, but but you can only know it in a very abstract way which sort of reminds me of what's going on here that that it, it's just it's just it, it's sort of like in, in in the matrix where what's his <laughs> who's, a, who's a lawrence fishburne character morpheus <laughs> right? i think that this is yeah. the red pill or the, the green pill one one gets through all the veneer and the stuff, uh, but you're going to be really unhappy. Exactly. Or you can just like, you know, eat a steak every night and, you know, and just do whatever you want. And you're just, you'll just be in the image. And, and Gigerich is all about just burn it all down. <laughs> just like, <laughs> you know, it, it, all the, the, the image, the paintings, the every, the, the flashy words, the poetry. Phew, you know, we need to look at cold, hard truth in, in, in the most abstract form. We need we need the rigor of logic of, of logos. But logos is a word. Yes, it is a word. Well, I can't, I'm having a hard time dealing with it. So he proposes, uh, and I think toward the end, you mentioned that Plato, doesn't he talk about like, a, that there is a way past the word to truth. I can't conceive that. I have a hard time. Gigerich talks about, you know, the, uh, he, he's very fond of the rise of, of technologos, yeah. of technology. He sees, he sees soul in that, like it, some logical distillation of consciousness that's happening. Sort of like we're, we're going out of subjectivity into the Borg or <laughs> something. It, it, you know, if you're a Star Trek fan, that might make sense it's to you. Star Trek fan, yeah. Uh, but, it, you know, so it, is, do you, I mean, do you see a way the truth past language where we could maybe ones and zeros? Yes. Well, yes and no. I think even Plato, as you said, conceives of a truth beyond language. I don't know that he figured out how to get there. And I think that was his struggle is that they're pro they're, he wanted to find that way. Right. But, you know, we constantly have to mediate what we do through language. This yeah. is the problem that until telepathy, I think, if we, you know, Vulcan mind melds to go back to Star Trek would be, <laughs> would probably, you know, I have not yeah. mind melded recently, but you know, that might actually, you know, surpass the need for language. Yeah. But I think he really had the goal of being able to find this truth without mediation. But I think what he did do was understand that we do have this imprecise language, that we do have to work within this. So he started creating icons and metaphors, which would then force people to peer in, force people to analyze, force people to look into it. There's a line from uh, the symposium where one of the characters, Alcibiades, uh, says of Socrates that you have to open up his logoi like it's a box and you have to peer inside them. And so I think that, you know, by putting some of the onus on the hearer or on the reader to open up the logos, it's a way of potentially getting around the challenge. And I think, you know, this is something that we even see in the classroom as well. You know, one of the things that Plato wanted us to do was to embrace the confusion, 
I mean, how often have we said that to our students? You know, that's the whole job of the teacher is that we want them to, you know, understand what they don't know. We want to hear what they, what they don't understand. And we want to be able to guide them in digging deeper and analyzing and drawing their own conclusions. Interesting. Um, you mentioned Zoom and I can't help thinking uh, as we're talking and as I go back into the cave, which is a nice place to visit from time to time, just to sort of refresh. It's lovely this time of year. In, in the midst of a pandemic, <laughs> it occurs to me, you know, I just, I'm being totally imprecise, but um, maybe you have some thoughts on sort of the zeitgeist right now in terms of, uh, you know, we're, we're teaching classes on Zoom. Yes. You know, we got our phones, we got our laptops, we got the, the cameras. We got, and it just brings me back to the prisoners of the cave. <laughs> we also have TV. Yes. We're a little digitally distracted. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some of us more than others. We're mm -hmm. all of our, our subjectivities are housed in different servers across lots of social media. What's happened to the human being that, the, you know, in terms of that, that perspective that, that Plato captures, you know, in terms of the, the cave prisoner, how are we like as students and teachers, where are we in relation to that image or that icon <laughs> in, well, in this moment? I, I just, what do you well, think of that? Well, it's interesting that you bring that up because I do know that the uh, shadows on the wall were actually um, part of the foundation for a lot of film and television criticism that he was actually, you know, discussing uh, the image on the wall. And this idea of film and television as a kind of image projected on a wall, even in Catholicism, uh, the Saint, Saint Claire, you know, um, who I share a name with, she's actually the patron saint of television because she was able to see a vision of a dinner on a wall. And be even though she was too ill to attend, she was able to recount the whole thing. So there is definite precedent for seeing television and Netflix and film as a kind of projection on the wall. I do think that very optimistically that one of the things that Zoom has done for us is sort of remind us of how technology can sometimes be a mode of distancing for us, can feel almost imperfect. You know, going back to the question of mimesis, uh, if we can't see things in the ideal form, mm -hmm. if we can't see the ideal form of the chair or the bed, then at least having the mimesis, we have some place to sit, you know? So Zoom, I think, is a mimesis. I think it is a necessary mimesis. It's a necessary imitation of the real thing. And as long as the real thing remains accessible, inaccessible, I think it's important that we keep it and hold to it. But at the same time, I think we're all kind of the prisoners and we're ready to get out of our chains <laughs> on some level. <laughs> I, I always, I always the, what I always compare Zoom to, I consider it the frozen yogurt of communication. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it's a great thing if you're having a craving, you know, you want something sweet, it, it's there, we're able to talk just like you and I are able to talk across the country in different time zones. But at the end of the day, you still want the ice cream. You know, you still scream for ice cream for a reason, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think that Plato would, again, I think Plato is a lot more understanding than we give him credit for about human limitation. And a lot of his work really resides in understanding who we are as humans, what our limitations are. So given that the mimesis or the shadow is the only thing we can have right now via Zoom, it's certainly better than having no inquiry, no discourse at all. But I think at the same time, and I really do think that one of the outcomes of this situation is that when this is over, I do think there may be a new bucolic where people do not want to rely on the technology as mm. much as people do want to leave and have more person-to-person -person interaction. So interesting gives us a new appreciation of what we have. You know, I, I, as you're talking about that, I'm reminded of, uh, of planning for this course. And, uh, you know, I have 
uh, CNN in the background. You know, I'm, I'm on my computer. Um, my phone's handy in case someone calls. And then um, about six o'clock, I just noticed the sun going down yeah. or, or just like the twilight. I was like, and I, and I just like, I got to get up. I was just, <laughs> there was like a moment where I got to get out of this. And yeah. I went, went out in the backyard. It was a nice summer, uh, summer at dusk. And, um, and there was, there was that sort of, yeah. I, the Greeks would call it catharsis or I think so. <laughs> that sense of like it's not going into not uh, necessarily the, the same experience of the the K prisoner because I, I think it was probably disorienting uh, for him. But there was that sort of like you're talking about. I think I, hopefully there will be that that sort of you know yeah. readjustment in terms of our our priorities and. And I think that one th advantage that we do have over the hypothetical prisoners in the cave is that we already know that what we're staring at is essentially a shadow. Mm -hmm. you know? And don't get me wrong, I love that we have Zoom and I think we are so fortunate to have this technology. You know, I work in early modern literature and thinking about bubonic plague where they didn't have any of this. Mm -hmm. You know, they would just have to shut themselves in, the theaters were closed, but you couldn't look on YouTube to, to watch something. Mm -hmm. I mean, could you imagine if we didn't have Wi-Fi and this was going on and we didn't have Zoom? So it, I'm so grateful to have these modes of communication so we can at least preserve some of this. Mm -hmm. But I know my students and I know many of my colleagues as well, we, we do miss the days of in-person communication, that there is an in, 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 ineffable something that is missing. Right. Well, Claire, so, um, so much for your time. Thank you. And um, this concludes our session on Plato's Allegory of the Cave. And um, I encourage everybody to read uh, Dr. Summer's article in Arion, uh, School of Shadows Return to Plato's Cave. It's in the uh, uh, volume 25, issue three, uh, winter 2018. A great article. Thanks Thank again for your time, uh, Dr. Summers. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> and stop recording. Yeah.